Thank you for coming. Today I'm going to show you how to do some 3D design and we're going to cover some of the tools that you can use, the free tools that are available, and some of the concepts that you'll need to know while designing your things to make them suitable for 3D printing. I'm primarily going to show you how to use Tinkercad and I'll go over some of the other free software as well. We'll also cover 123D design and we'll cover some software that you would use with a 3D printer just so that you can see how it's done. There's Wings 3D. This is a subdivision modeler. It's free. It's open source. I haven't used it, so I can't make a recommendation about it, but it's been around for a long time and should be pretty mature. FreeCAD appears to be a competent parametric modeler. It's free, it's open source, it seems to be a staple in the community. This is definitely the next 3D modeling program I'll be learning. And let's talk about SketchUp for a moment. SketchUp was built by Trimble, and about the time Google was getting pretty serious about Google Maps, they needed some serious 3D firepower to model all the buildings on the face of the planet. So they acquired Google SketchUp. Everyone seems to think that SketchUp is free, but it's really more like a freemium package. If you want all the features, you have to buy the Pro package, which is somewhere in the $700 or $800 range. It's not a program that I enjoy using. Uh, I like all the CAD programs I cover here, but I don't like SketchUp. It's pretty good for modeling buildings. I've used it to model sheds and furniture that I've built, but for anything CAD related, it's the last thing I would reach for. So if you only know one program, don't make it SketchUp. And that brings us to Blender. Blender is not a program that I'm comfortable with, nor that I would ever use, but don't let that put it off for you. Blender is about the most competent 3D program out there, and it is free. It not only does 3D models, but it also does rendering, and it does rigging, and it does animation. People have made whole movies with this, or at least animated shorts, on par with anything Pixar has done, as far as the layman can tell and it is full featured believe me the reason that I don't use it is simply because it's not suited to CAD applications especially it's a terrific program for people who are more artistic than I am who can build models freehand even sculpt them uh, and that's not a skill that I have I'm more of a left-brained person and I work in dimensions using primitives and that's how my brain works and that's how I make things that I want to 3D print. Blender's uh, fort is more along the lines of creating media, movies, screenshots, or presentation, that sort of thing. If you're interested in that and if you have the aptitude for it, Blender is the guy to go to, just not necessarily for 3D printing. Autodesk Fusion 360 is fast becoming the most popular software in the consumer 3D modeling world. It's normally a little pricey at $300 per year, but it's nowhere near the price of its big brother's Autodesk Inventor or AutoCAD. Fortunately, they've made it free for hobbyists and educators. The link can be hard to find, but it's worth it. This is a very competent program, and it warrants serious consideration. Dassault Systems SolidWorks is a major contender in the industrial realm. It's probably not priced anywhere where a consumer could purchase it, but I mention it because it is available for free for students, and that may be worth your effort to learn it even just while you're a student. It does incredible things. Uh, not only can you model with it, but you can create, you can uh, define constraints, motion constraints and other constraints so that you can rig your model and figure out how it moves rather than just how it fits 
you can even have it calculate based on material uh, sizes, lengths, thicknesses, shapes, and forces. You can figure out where the stresses will overcome your material and figure out uh, where your design is weak and fix it. So it does things that none of my tools can do and it's certainly worth a look. And now we come to the fun part. The software that I'm going to show you, all the software that I use, comes from the same vendor. If I search for 123D, I will find Autodesk's 123D suite of free applications. And here they are. The six that are in the suite right now are shown here, and the two that I'm going to show you are Tinkercad and 123D Design. It's in your interest to look at the other four as well. They are incredible pieces of software, free or otherwise, and I'll cover them briefly here. 123D Catch, if you download that on your tablet, it gives you guides for how to position your tablet to take many pictures around an object, and then it will send those pictures to their cloud and it will process them and create a 3D model for you from those photographs. There are very few technologies out there that do this right now. The only other one that I know that is actually successful at it costs $15,000 outright. This one is free. You can't beat that. 123D Make is an incredible bit of software. It's almost hard to describe what it does, but you can create 3D models from 2D cuts. So if you have a 3D model it will print out templates for you to cut out of cardboard so that you can stack the cardboard together into a 3D representation of your model. And it does several other things too. You can use uh, two-dimensional cardboard assemblies or you could use things other than cardboard such as plywood. It's worth checking out. 123D Sculpt I think is only available on the iPad but it allows you to use some tools to freehand model in three dimensions. 123D Circuits is pretty incredible. It's something like Fritzing, but it actually has an Arduino tool in it with an Arduino software emulator and hardware emulator in real time. Nothing else like it for free, I tell you what. Here are some supplemental applications that you'll need that are not necessarily 3D modelers, but they're useful in the tool chain for producing your 3D models. First is Paint.net. Don't search for it as Paint, period, N-E-T it will try to navigate to it with modern browsers. So type in paint.net and go to paint, getpaint.net. It's really tricky to figure out where to download this. Come over here. Don't click any of those ads with the green buttons. And click the download now. And then click up here again. It's very confusing and very annoying, but it's worth the trouble. It's a great program. Paint.net is a photo editor. You could also draw with it if you have the talent for that. It's a capable alternative to Photoshop. It is easy to use. It works in much the same way. It's extensible using plugins from a community where all the plugins can be managed from right inside the application. I don't use plugins. I never have. I can do anything I need to do with Paint.net right out of the box. I've never had to install one. Paint.net is useful for modifying and creating raster images such as JPEGs or GIFs or bitmaps. Inkscape is a vector art editor. It edits SVG files which are composed of lines, points, circles, and other primitives they're used for different things and you'll probably want to you'll probably want to have both on hand I only use Inkscape for one purpose one function and I'll show you what that is if I wanted to do any further vector art I would use a more competent program I prefer Corel Draw uh, most people prefer Adobe Illustrator which is both are commercial Illustrator is not nearly as affordable as the low-end versions of Corel Draw but it's certainly competent Let's get started with Tinkercad. First you'll need a login. When you go to sign in or sign up, you may run into the same problem that I do. I like to disable third-party cookies for security reasons, but all of the 123D applications require third-party cookies to use the Autodesk Universal Login. 
I have to go into my settings and then over here under the settings tab I scroll down to privacy under advanced settings click content settings and uncheck block third-party cookies now this icon will disappear and I can sign in or sign up now that I'm logged in it will show me all of the designs that I've created before let's start a new one by clicking create new design like most cloud applications this one will give your new document a name but unlike untitled one untitled two this one gives us more happy names it'll comp compose it from some nonsense words and that's all fun but not much more useful than untitled one so first let's click on design in the menu and choose properties we'll give it a proper name and save changes note the spinning arrows this is your indicator that a save is happening every action you take will incur a save this is how the undo operation works if ever you make an action and don't give it time to save that action will not be available in the undo queue something to bear in mind when we get started in Tinkercad you'll see the work plane the blue work plane is always present and it's the surface upon which we can place new objects. Tinkercad works by dragging objects out of the toolbar and onto the work plane. All of these primitives can be manipulated but only on the footprint that applies to the work plane. So even though this cube has six sides and eight corners, I can only manipulate one side and four corners, the ones that are touching the blue work plane. First let's learn to navigate. If I place an object in the center of the work plane, I can look around it using my right mouse button. I will click and hold it and then drag the plane around so I'll see the object from all sides. I can look under, over, but no further than here. However, I can look all the way around to the front again. If I wish to zoom in on the object or part of the object, I can place my mouse where I want to go and use the mouse wheel. But unlike some programs, it ignores the mouse cursor. It will zoom into the center of the screen. Lastly, I can drag the object around with the mouse button and you can see that there are arrows that indicate the distance from its original position where it currently resides. If I wanted to change the size or shape of this object, I could grab any of these manipulators on its footprint. If I hover over one of them, it will become red. Some dimensions will appear and if I hold the left mouse button and drag it around I can change that points position on the work plane this changes the shape or size of the object if I wanted to keep the dimensions proportional or it might be said to maintain the aspect ratio of the shape I can hold the shift key and then you can see that the X and Y dimensions of this box remain equal no matter where I put my mouse cursor. I can move it all the way to the right or all the way to the left and it affects both dimensions. You'll also note that it affects the third dimension, the z-axis, the height of the object. It won't do that if I don't use the shift button. But if I use the shift button the height is affected. Since this is a cube it's obvious that moving the footprint around will affect the size and shape of the entire cube and it seems inherently acceptable other shapes however might not be quite so much for example 
the shape of a pyramid would no longer be a pyramid if I didn't use the shift button or if I didn't maintain its height. So it becomes more important for some than for others. If I've added an object I don't want anymore, I can click on it and you can tell that it's selected because you can see its manipulators on the corners of its footprint. I can click on it and press delete on the keyboard and it's gone. Working with our original object, there are a few more manipulators that we haven't talked about. If I were to make this exactly the same size that I want on the bottom, but I also need to manipulate the height, there is a vertical height manipulator. I can hover over this and it is the only manipulator that's not relative to the footprint which changes the size or, or shape of the object. There are two more manipulators to look at here. This cone is the height manipulator, sorry, the vertical offset manipulator, or just vertical manipulator. You can see that it shows me the distance of the object from the plane at any given time. This is useful if you've moved it away from the plane and want to put it back without having to eyeball it and see, is it aligned with the plane? I know that if there's a distance of zero millimeters, that it sits directly atop the plane. And lastly, there are three rotational manipulators, one for each axis. This one will rotate it on the x-axis. This one will rotate it on the y-axis and this will rotate it on the z-axis. Note where my mouse is. If it's far enough from the object, I have a granularity of one degree in my rotations. But if I move my mouse cursor closer to the object, the increments become smaller. Now it's very easy to control the rotation and I can drop it easily and quickly at 45 degrees or 90 degrees and most of the time that's really what I want to do anyway. With a cube of course it's all the same unless it's a different shape. Next we'll explore grouping. If for example I have this large cube and I have a cylinder, if I wanted to attach the flat part of the cylinder to this flat part of the cube, I have a few challenges ahead of me. First, I have to rotate this cylinder so that the two faces are facing each other. Now I can move it around, but whoops, look, it goes right inside that other object. If I want those two surfaces to be against each other, I need a way to place that cylinder up against that surface and not go past it. I also don't want the cylinder to be directly on the edge of the cube's surface. I want it to be centered. There are a few solutions to these problems. The simplest would be if I select this cube, I want a plane right here. I've dragged a work plane from my helper's margin and dropped it on this surface. I could drop it anywhere on any surface, but I'll drop it on the surface that I'm going to attach an object to. Now that I have that work plane, I've rotated the footprint of my objects by 90 degrees. So all of my manipulators are also rotated. Now I have the ability to work on different footprints of my objects. My vertical distance manipulator is now horizontal, but I can move it until it says there are zero millimeters between the object and the plane. Now my cylinder is up against the work plane and the work plane is up against the side of my cube. I know now that my cylinder is up against the side of my cube. Now I can go about changing the position of this cylinder. There's an alignment tool. If I
click the cylinder and then shift click the cube, I can select multiple items. I can also drag a rectangle around the items that I want to select. And once I have all the items selected, in this case two objects, I can click adjust and then align. Now I get a new set of manipulators. Those manipulators allow me to align objects in three dimensions. Along the top edge I have three manipulators, a right alignment, a center alignment, and a left alignment on the y-axis. On the x-axis I have a left, center, and right alignment, and of course on the z-axis I have the same. Notice when I highlight some of these that there are orange outlines indicating where the objects will be moved if I click on that button. If I want my cylinder to be aligned on the z and y axes, I will click the center for the y axis and the center for the z axis. It's important to understand that the position of the two objects relative to each other will dictate which objects move when you incite an alignment operation. If the two objects are offset from each other such that both are outside of the other in any way, they will both move. If one object is fully within the bounds of the other object, the smaller object will be moved only. Now that I'm done aligning these two objects, I want this temporary work plane to go away. I'll just click here and click elsewhere in the background and it goes away. You can see the W on this icon. That is a keystroke shortcut. I can just press W at any time to drop a temporary work plane and again to get rid of it. Now this was an exercise in grouping but we still haven't grouped anything. We still have two distinct objects, two distinct primitives here. If we select both we can come up and click the group button and you see that they both became the same color, whereas the cylinder used to be orange, they are both now red. You also see that the manipulators indicate a footprint which spans the dimensions of both objects. Now if I click elsewhere and click just the cylinder, you see that it appears to select a footprint under both objects. That is because as I drag it around you see this is now a singular object. There are no two objects. This means that if I try to resize the cylinder, perhaps by grabbing this edge, you see that it doesn't really just resize the cylinder, it resizes the entire object. Well, I certainly didn't want that. It did a save when I was finished. I'll press Control Z to undo that change. Let's explore a few more operations. Now that I have a strange abnormal shape here, I can create a copy of it by holding the Alt key on the keyboard and dragging this object away from itself. Notice that at any time when I'm dragging an object around, I can move it in two dimensions along the work plane. If I want to move it in just one dimension, I can hold the Shift key and now no matter where my mouse cursor goes, even though I'm dragging it in a circle, the object will only move left to right or forward and backward. Let's say for a moment that I wanted to create two pieces that interlock with each other. I have a copy of the original and I could rotate it 180 degrees and because the cylinder is perfectly centered on the face of the cube I know that those two cylinders are now facing each other and symmetrical. Now because I created a copy of the first object, the second object is also a composite of the grouping of the first object. This is interesting because I can ungroup it and now manipulate its parts. If I wanted to make an interlocking piece, I could take this cylinder and I can change its color to a very special color called a hole. 
A hole is a subtractive shape, meaning that anything that intersects with it becomes removed. The dimensions of this cylinder are 20 millimeters in length from flat surface to flat surface. Now if I want to move it all the way against the surface of this cube, I can move it inside 20 spaces using the arrow keys. And now, because my grid snaps at one millimeter intervals, I've moved it 20 millimeters by pressing the arrow key 20 times. Now that it's perfectly up against this face of the cube, if I select both of those objects and regroup them, I now have a hole in the side of my cube. Again using the shift key I can move this piece over the first and you can see that they perfectly interlock. Now that worked by coincidence because everything is symmetrical. But what if I had started with a shape that was less symmetrical, whereas this cylinder was no longer centered? I create a copy and then I try to rotate it. Now, if I create a hole here, they no longer align. What I should do instead of rotating this object is I should mirror it. Now you can see if I were to move it over the cylinders align. That brings us to perspective. There are certain operations in Tinkercad that will behave differently based on your perspective. The first is mirroring. If you choose to mirror an object, again note the orange outline indicating where the object will be moved if we perform this operation. But if I change my perspective, that same arrow does something different. It's usually pretty obvious what will happen. But what if I set my perspective right in the middle? It becomes less obvious which of those two operations this arrow will perform. So pay attention to the orange box, the orange outline that indicates what the move will do or what the action will do. Let's have a look at the ruler tool now. If I want a ruler, I can do two things if I drop one of these on the grid. Most importantly, the ruler only works if you place it exactly where you want it. You can drop it, but it may not be exactly where you want. Go ahead and zoom in here and place that circle exactly in its place. Now that my ruler is placed at the exact corner of this object, I can do some measurements. The grid, of course, shows me some measurements in general. I know that each of the small intervals is a millimeter, and each of the large intervals, indicated by bold lines, is a centimeter, because my grid is using millimeters as units. If I'm using imperial units, things change, but the grid can still be used as a ruler as long as you're paying attention to what you're doing. However, this is generally not sufficient when you're working with multiple objects. Unless this object is aligned with one of the corners 
in the centimeter grid. You probably don't want to have to count all of those millimeter intervals and do math in your head to make sure your objects are where they should be relative to each other. It's easier to have two objects exactly where you want them using a ruler tool. When I have a ruler tool placed, clicking on any object will give me all of its dimensions, every one of them. This makes it easy to analyze where your objects are, where they should be moved to, and by how much. But most importantly, you can choose other objects. And if the ruler is relative to the first object, selecting the second object makes the two objects relative to each other when you look at the dimensions. If, for example, I wanted this edge to be 90 millimeters from this, this edge, I can see right now that it's 80 millimeters apart. I can click here and type 90 and press enter and it will move the object for me. Now before you go getting excited, most applications in 3D design do this everywhere. Tinkercad's shortcoming is that this is the only place that I know that this can be done. But it is there, it can be done, and you'll come to use it quite a bit. One of the problems that you'll run into, and I'll tell you the rule right now, once you rotate an object, your ability to do most things with it diminishes substantially. If I rotate this object by 45 degrees, remember that the footprint is relative to the work plane. The footprint doesn't turn with the object. It stays parallel to the work plane. Now, even though both of these objects were 64 millimeters wide, this one is now 71.42 difficult millimeters wide because that's the size of its footprint. The rule is thus. Always size, shape, and move your objects first before you rotate them on any axis. Once you rotate them, you cannot properly size them, manipulate them, or work with them in any way except to put a work plane up against one of their surfaces. But you still can't orient the work plane on the original axis relative to the orientation of that object. So always rotate last when working with your objects. Now that I have my ruler's work done, I can dismiss it by clicking the X or dropping another ruler somewhere else or just moving the ruler to the next place. Now let's try importing some files into Tinkercad. As you can see here, first off, we can only import STL or SVG files. We can't import raster images or photos such as JPEGs or PNGs. So to use those files, we're going to have to convert them. Let's start paint.net and I'll open a file, a picture that I've taken. This is a clip that holds sheet music in place when you're playing an instrument. I just ran into my son's room and grabbed it and took a photo with his phone and emailed it to myself. I took a photo of the object on a white piece of paper just to add contrast. That makes it very easy for us to do some manipulation with just a few actions. I can use the magic wand selection tool and it selected too much of this so I'm going to turn down the tolerance a little and try again. And that is perfect. It didn't get some of this stuff out here, but I don't care about that. I care about these lines up against the object that I'm interested in. That's all that matters, and they are perfect. So now I'll change the selection mode to Add, and I'll add some selection to this just using the rectangle select. I'll grab every part of this photo that I don't want and I'll just press the delete key on the keyboard. Now all of that checkerboard in the background is a transparent color. 
I can change the selection mode to invert and then take my rectangle that's not working at all I need to select the background and now I will invert my selection and now I've selected the object itself I can come in and use a flood tool select black and flood it with black. That didn't quite do the job, so I'll use a paintbrush. Set the brush width to an enormous size and just paint it. Make sure I get everything. Now I have a silhouette of the original object. Very easy to do. I'll come back and select my magic, paint, magic wand tool again. In fact, I won't do that. I will just create a new layer underneath this one, shift it down, and I will paint that layer white. Make sure this layer is selected. Choose white from the palette and make the entire background white. Now I have a black and white image, and that's really what I'm after. That's all I need, but it's too large, so I will crop the entire image just to make it a little more yeah, succinct. Perfect. I'll save. And I'll change the format to a PNG. It'll ask me to flatten it because I have multiple layers and that's fine. After saving I always do a control Z to undo and I get my layers back anyway. I'm done with paint.net for now. Next we'll move this image into Inkscape. First we'll open the clip and it will ask if we want to link or embed the image. We want to embed it. Now we can see the raster in this document and it has some slightly jagged edges but that looks pretty good. There's a lot of contrast on the edges and that's all we need. So we'll take the pointer tool and select this bitmap element then in the path menu we'll choose trace bitmap and the dialog that appears will select edge detection and then click update it's drawn an image here and it's not a spectacular image but the fact that it drew it means that we've done everything right we can then click OK and close this dialog it has created a trace of that object out of lines and points. Now I'm going to control mouse wheel to zoom out and I'll click this pointer tool again just because Inkscape is finicky and I'll drag this away. But look what happened. It's hollow. That's not what we wanted. So I will undo and undo and try again using trace bitmap and I'll go back to brightness cutoff do another update and click OK and close it. Now when I move it you can see that it's solid. There are circumstances where you want one over the other so I wanted to demonstrate the difference between the two. Now that I, ha <clears throat> now that I have it done 
which one of these was the original raster image and which one was the trace. Well, I can see on my screen that one is more jagged and one is smoother. The vector will be the smooth one, but I can tell more definitively by choosing the Edit Paths tool. And now all of the nodes appear on this one, so I know this is the guy. But it doesn't make much difference because when we save, this raster data will be completely discarded. And it will ask us to save in any number of formats. We'll choose the SVG. And it will tell us that it already exists because I've done this a few times for the video. And we'll replace it. Now back in Tinkercad, we can import the vector image that we created in Inkscape. In the import, t under the import tab, we can click file to import a file, and then click choose file to browse to the one that we created. And then, I always import at 100%, but you can adjust that if you have the need. Height, it doesn't matter, we'll probably have to adjust that when we're done. Just click import, and if it's a supported format, it will appear. It will probably look a little strange. You can see that this one is way too large. So I'll zoom out. And the height is only 10 millimeters. I'm going to want to size it and hold the shift key to keep its aspect ratio, but if I do that, when I shrink it, it's going to become very, very short. So I want to increase its height substantially before I do that. Now I can make it an appropriate size so it can at least fit in our work plane, on our work plane. And now I can measure it. Rather than using the ruler tool, I'll just move it around so that it fits in a reasonable place on the grid. Now the original object is 93 millimeters long. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 centimeters here. So I want to shrink it further until it fits nearly there. And I'll just drag it out until it is 93. For this particular object, the size is not terribly critical. For any kind of machine part, it would be much more critical. Now the original part is a different material, so I don't need it to be the same thickness. I need it to be a thickness which lends it the same properties, the same flexibility, the same lateral strength, those sorts of things. Because I'm using plastic and the original piece is metal, I'm going to make this just a little bit thicker. Two millimeters is probably thicker than I need it to be, and one millimeter is probably a little thin. So I'm going to set this to a 0.5 snap grid so that I can make this 1.5 millimeters high. Now that that's done, we can see that there are some imperfections in the part itself, which I didn't notice in Inkscape. But that's okay. I'd rather fix them here anyway. That's easy to do. You can see this little piece here doesn't belong. So I'm going to just add a hole right here. A very small hole. Now bear in mind, you can't just select this part of the object. Look what happens when I try. I selected the entire clip because that's part of the clip. It's only one piece. So instead I have to add a hole. And make sure that it's precisely placed. And then group them. And that worked splendidly. If there were any other parts that needed to be removed or I want to add them all to a single group rather than adding and grouping and adding and grouping. I'm not too concerned about any of these other imperfections. 
they probably are subtle and won't even come out in the 3D print. So, I think we're good to go. This has automatically been saved in Tinkercad, so the next step is to simply download for 3D printing. I always choose STL. Some of these other formats can be used by other software, but all 3D modeling software that is worth using supports STL. I would point out that SketchUp does not support STL. I'll click that button. And then I'll send it to my printer. So let's do this the easy way. I have my 3D printer set up to run on OctoPrint. So I'll navigate to the OctoPrint interface, log in. Choose my printer and connect. Make sure your printer is turned on first. And now I have some files from some previous jobs. I'll just clear those out and upload this one. When you upload an STL file directly to OctoPrint, it tries to slice it for you. Now this method is convenient, but it doesn't give me a lot of insight into how the slicing went, whether it was successful or had some issues. I'll turn on my printer's heaters. Because those take a while to heat up. And then When it sliced it, it took my STL file and created a GCO file, which I now have to load. And there it is. You can see this outline. Because of the options I chose when I sliced it, it is generating what's called a skirt. And the skirt is always a good idea because it will get the plastic flowing before you're printing your actual part and the plastic does not flow immediately no matter what you do you do need a kind of buffer to start extruding before you get to the part this is the first layer and I'm just gonna scroll up I'm gonna zoom in first you can see when I get down in there that it's displaying all of the individual lines that it's going to lay down to compose this part. And they go diagonally one way on the first layer. And then they'll go diagonally the other way on the next layer. This is a rectilinear pattern and it gives the object structural integrity when it's all done. If this were thick enough and large enough I could tell it to print some hollow part in the middle to save material as long as it was strong enough but this part is very thin so it's going to be all solid. Interestingly it gives me some information about each layer how long it will take, how much material is in there, how much machining is going on and up here the same sort of statistics overall the total print time, the amount of material that it's going to require, and how long it will take. I'm just going to go ahead and send that to the printer.
Here's the finished part next to the original. I was able to duplicate a real world object without doing any actual design at all, but simply by walking through a simple tool path. It was very easy to do, but you could use this procedure to modify a real world object or improve on it by changing the model after importing into Tinkercad and you can come up with all kinds of new things on your own. You could even create things from simple pencil drawings or pen and ink drawings this way. Get creative. Autodesk 123D Design works differently than Tinkercad. Tinkercad is a mesh editor. Everything in Tinkercad is a composite of points and lines between points in 3D space. 123D Design is different. It has solids. And these solids aren't a series of points and lines. They're actual primitives that the application knows how to conceive. It knows that a sphere is a calculation of an infinite number of points relative to its center. It can treat it as such, and certain operations can be performed here that can't be performed on a mesh of a similar shape. It's a similar grid situation. We can just drag this object around. They call this cruising. But they don't have temporary work planes like Tinkercad does. Instead, they have tools to get the objects to relate to each other in the ways that you would normally need a mesh for, or sorry, a work plane for. For example, if I wanted to take my earlier example and place a box here and then move it around, I would first click the box to select it and then I would choose the Move Rotate tool. Now, we're in a similar situation we would be in Tinkercad as soon as we select an object. We have a series of manipulators that we can use. The control and navigation are the same as Tinkercad's. I'll use the middle mouse button to, pa to pan around, just as I did in Tinkercad. And I'll use the right mouse button to orbit, like I did in Tinkercad. But to move objects, you can move them in any direction with these manipulators. There's a vertical offset manipulator. And again, the offset from the plane is displayed. Or I can move along a single axis using the axis move manipulators. I can also use rotation. But here, you don't have the fine and coarse gradients. Instead, you have what they call a pill. You can see it looks kind of like a capsule that's been broken open and there's something inside it. In here I can just enter the value that I want. I can do that with any of these, really. The pill is a contextual menu and Sometimes the pill doesn't appear as the capsule that we just saw. Instead, it will appear as a gear in a button, and when we click on that, it expands to the other actions that are available in the current context. The context is generally defined as the selection. If I have selected a solid, then I get a certain number of, a certain set of actions that are available in that context. If once that solid is selected, I choose a surface, then I get a pill that applies to surfaces. If I choose an edge, then I get a pill that applies to edges, and if I choose a point, then I get a pill that applies to points. So, depending on your display, you may or may not see that when the object is selected, there's this green outline around the visible exterior of the solid. When you're using it on your desktop, it's still almost a little hard to see. But if I click outside the solid, so there's no context, and then I choose click any part of the solid, then the solid is selected. 
Then I select the part of the solid that I was really after as a second operation. Now, when you start using SketchUp, everybody seems to be very impressed with the push-pull tool. They think that's just gnarly. Well, this one has a push-pull tool too. If I select a face and press P on the keyboard, I get a push-pull manipulator and I can just take that surface and move it along its perpendicular axis. I can't move it anywhere else, but I can push-pull all I want on that axis. If I want to move it anywhere else, then what I would do instead is choose click and shift click its four edges and then in the pill I can tweak and I can do it on all three axes. I can also do this with points. And of course, I can also just do it with the face. And if the four edges that you were going to select happen to be the surrounding edges for a face, it's easier to select the face. If I want something fancier than a push-pull, I can choose the Extrude tool. The Extrude tool has a lot of flexibility. I can choose to extrude here, and I can change the angle of the extrusion. How crazy is that? And I can even extrude in the negative, and now that that's red, it shows me that it's a subtraction instead of an addition, and that is determined because the current merge operation is merge, and if I move into itself then it changes to subtract but I can also change it to intersect and say that's the only part I wanted to include. Let's talk about grouping for a moment. If I have two objects that I want grouped together in Tinkercad I have to select both of those objects and use grouping in order to make them work together. No matter which one I grab, it selects both and they move in tandem. If I use the snap tool, something interesting happens. I'll ungroup these. Now you can see they're separate again. Now let's use the Snap tool. Now when I snap the cylinder to the cube, you see that they move in tandem again. The Snap tool grouped these items together automatically. Now grouping works differently in 123D Design because once I have a group, If I double click on any of the primitives in that composite object, I can select just that primitive. But they're still grouped. That's a convenient difference from Tinkercad, but you need to be aware of the behavior because they don't behave quite the same way. Now there's not much that I would do in 123D Design that I couldn't do just as easily or e more easily in Tinkercad, but there are a few things that I can do that I like better. First, 123D Design supports sketches. Sketches are two-dimensional drawings on a work plane that can then be extruded into three dimensions. So here in the sketch menu, there are some basic shapes that they give you and I can click a rectangle and choose a starting point and then an ending point and when I'm all done I click the exit sketch button and you can see this bold outline 
filled in with a bit of color on the workspace on the work plane. I can still modify it. It has a workspace, uh, a sketch plane. It has four edges, and it has four points. I can also choose any of these others, or create a polyline, which is a set of nodes. which I can lay out here and if I close that properly and then press enter on the keyboard I have a closed sketch. Once I have a closed sketch I can go to the push-pull tool and I get a hint to say select the face of a solid to press or pull. See what happens? this is not a solid. I cannot extrude this with a solid tool. Instead I'll want to use the extrude tool. With the extrude tool the hint tells me select a 2D shape or face of a solid. This is a 2D shape so I can select it and now I have a manipulator. And I have just changed my two-dimensional drawing into a three-dimensional shape. You can see though, if I put that back, press enter when you're done, you can see that my 2D drawing is still at the bottom of that. If I move this, the drawing is still there. I could extrude it again if I wanted to. I could modify it. I could choose any of its points and drag them around. Do whatever I want with it and extrude again. But if I'm done with it, I can delete it. I'll just highlight it and press the delete key on the keyboard. If I start with a primitive, such as a rectangle or a circle, there are other operations I can perform on it afterward. I can use a fillet on that sketch. And to do that, I'll just click to edit the sketch. I'll click on this edge. And then I'll click on the other edge. And now my manipulator allows me to modify the fillet. Down here you can see that I'm specifying the radius. I'll make it five millimeters and I could do that on any one of these. And then I could extrude that. You can see the radius here from the fillets that were left over. I can grab those and move it about. Now another thing you may find you want to do is to take a surface and cut it. If I take a large cube, I can take one of its faces and do some interesting things with it because every face can be a sketch. It's a two-dimensional part of a 3D entity. Over here I have a split solid. And I could choose this solid and then a splitting entity. So I'll create a splitting entity here. got some strange stuff going on. I didn't want to do that. I'll move this point back over where it ought to be and this one over to where it makes some sense. But now 
I can select that as my splitting entity. So I'll choose the body to split and then the splitting entity is here. And I'll press enter to complete the operation. Now, it doesn't look like it did anything, but they are split. I can choose different operations for the top and bottom half. I can even just delete this one. This is something that isn't as easy to do in Tinkercad. You have to create three-dimensional objects and impose a shape on their side, turn them over, extrude them, and then make a hole out of them. This can be much more sophisticated. You can even use cuts that are not um, just curves. You could use text, you could use images that you've converted. There's a lot of flexibility there. Now I want to show you how to deal with text. It seems like it should be a simple thing, and it certainly is a common thing that people want to do. Now, Tinkercad has some support for letters, but each letter is actually its own model. It's not really a lot of control. You'll have to do a lot of aligning, and it's easy enough to align the actual letters on a line, but what about the spacing? I can't reasonably use any tool to help me with the spacing. It's overall just going to be a nuisance. It's cute, but I find this utterly useless. Instead, somebody has written a tool to import text. This is a plugin, and I can drag it here and the script now offered, asks for input over in this inspector window. I can choose a font, but look what I have. I have many more fonts than this on my system, but I'm limited to just a handful of fonts here, and I may or may not like any of them. Certainly none of them are script or calligraphic. They're useful enough. This certainly does give me the opportunity to say something silly. But it doesn't really give me quite all the control that I want. For the most part, I really want to have control over the font. So, this will do in a pinch, but I'll show you how to do it in a more flexible way. Now you wouldn't think this would be so hard. It should be easy enough to import text from MS Paint or Paint.net or maybe Inkscape. Well, I've shown you how to convert rasters to vectors using Inkscape, and we can successfully import them. That does work, and I've done it this way on a project before. However, you find that you quickly question the sense behind this method and look for a text tool in Inkscape. Lo and behold, there is one, and it's pretty easy to use. Unfortunately, Inkscape's text tool takes advantage of a specific feature in the SVG file specification to support text. It defines text as a known entity instead of a set of polylines like the bitmap trace tool does. That should be a good thing, but Tinkercad doesn't recognize this text specification when you import the SVG file. It simply doesn't see it, and no text is imported into the workspace. So we have to go about this in a roundabout way. Now I'm going to show you how to do text with 123D Design, and this is what I would use this for more than anything else. I'll simply go to the text tool. I'll click on the work, work plane and specify a text position. It doesn't matter where. Now I get the text toolbar. I'll put in some text, and now you see I can choose any of my system fonts. 
even the silly ones they're all there every last one of them so let's find a script there's one and the height is not the height on the z-axis it's, it's the height on the y-axis this is really the font size so if I made this 20 it would make it just larger text and the angle you're fine just leaving it we're not going to use it here we're going to import it into Tinkercad most of the time I think now this becomes a sketch it's not the same as the other sketches it's not based on points and lines but it does exist in two dimensions so if I click one time to select it and then I come down to the pill and choose extrude text I get a manipulator now this is a very complex shape very complex so it requires an awful lot of computation and as soon as I extrude it into three dimensions it's going to need many times that much computation to work with it I would recommend that instead of extruding with the manipulator you simply enter the number of millimeters you want it to be in height. I'll make it 5. And that's a reasonable height. Now I'll click elsewhere to remove the selection and I have working 3D text. I will immediately export to STL and combine objects. Now that we're back in our Tinkercad, it's easy to use that text. We just take an object that we want to adorn with text, and we come into File Import, choose our file that we exported our text in, and Import. it obviously takes a very long time to import text because it's a very complicated shape well that worked out very nicely I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees and I'm going to move it up so we can see it I'll change this object below just a little bit more and I'll align the two Now I'll make the text a whole, move it down just a tad. In fact, I might make it a little taller because that's how I like to do holes. I like them to stick up a little bit. Now if I group these, Now you can see that I have exactly what I wanted. Text inletting in three dimensions. Now I want to talk about an important part of 3D printing. When you're modeling, let's say you have a complicated shape like this. This is not a suitable part to 3D print. The reason for that is printing is made up of a solid model which is cut into horizontal slices like a stack of pancakes. Most 3D printers which are FDM printers will print from the bottom up and every layer has to have something underneath it to hold it up. If it starts printing one of those pancakes somewhere in the air with nothing underneath it, it'll fall and then everything that's above it relying on that pancake to hold it up in the air will also fall and your print will fail. These are called overhangs. We have one here and we have one here. These have to be mitigated or when you print this you will have to generate what's called support material which means that they will put a temporary 
bit of material underneath these overhangs to give them support and they will try to make them ever so much slightly apart so that they won't stick to each other and can be removed later but support material can be expensive it's time consuming to print and it's time consuming to remove when the print is done so if you can avoid it that's best sometimes you can avoid it by not having sharp angles on your model sometimes you can avoid it by cutting your model into parts that will print more suitably and then gluing them back together when you're done so what constitutes an overhang obviously this is an overhang but where do you draw the line generally you can print up to 45 degrees without an overhang so if I were to print something like this it might be okay because I can print out a little bit up to 45 degrees if I move this in a bit obviously it's better if I move it out a bit it becomes steeper and if it's more steep than 45 degrees it won't work as support material another thing you can do is cut it up and so the easy way to do that is to take this and make a copy use shift to keep it on the same plane that's important and then create a hole Now you see that we have the same box around both objects in the same place, which is why we want to keep them aligned. If I make a separate hole for the second one, now I can group these. Pardon me, there's a bug currently that makes this freeze when it saves. So I'll try this again. I'll try to group these. Good. Now, what I want to do is reverse the hole on the second one. So, what I really want to do is create a plane here copy this object with a control C and then paste it on top of itself move it around so that it's where it ought to be and then delete the original now when I group the second one I have the remaining piece and you see that this guy is still hanging but what I've done is I've created a flat spot here and a flat spot here so that's no problem these really are suitable to put on the plane now I have two objects that can be printed on a flat plane no overhangs and when I'm done I'll have to glue them together. That brings us to another problem though and that is that these two objects while grouped together in this modeler that's fine but 
once we print them, they won't be grouped together anymore. Physically, they can be separated. So this was probably not a good way to separate them. What I should do is probably add a little bit of material. Just a teeny tiny bit to group them together. I can make this about one millimeter. I shouldn't use a cylinder. I should use a rectangle, a rectangular object. There's no reason for that to be any larger than one millimeter. And now those will at least be relative to each other when they print. That may seem a silly way to do it. It would be best to find a better way to cut these. A better way to cut this would be here. Now I have two objects which can easily be printed on their flat sides with no overhangs. All I have to do is rotate them a little and set them flatly on the plane and there we go. When I'm done I can glue them together. Sometimes it's useful to take these objects and align them up against each other as they should be. And create an alignment hole so that when you're reassembling these using glue or dowels or whatever means you decide you have a way to align them easily. Now that we have a hole we'll want two of those Now, 
those hosts will line up when we're finished. One other thing that's useful to know is that thin walls on perpendicular angles not have a lot of strength when printed. So if, for example, I have two of these attached to each other in a corner, which I do quite often, this joint right here will be a little bit weak. It'll be weaker than this plate itself or this plate itself and these plates will bend a little bit depending on the material that you use but the joint will incur stress. So it's often useful to add what's called a fillet. I promise it's pronounced fillet not fillet but it's spelled the same. Tinkercad doesn't have a function for that. Most CAD programs do, and they'll create a nice little curved filling in here. What we do instead in Tinkercad is we just stick a wedge in there, and it works splendidly. It's easier to print than a curvy surface anyway, and we don't need more than that to add some strength to this. So I'll make certain that it snug in that corner. Make it short. It doesn't need to be big. Five millimeters is pretty big. But that's the thickness of my material, so that's what I would probably use. And then just drag it out all the way to the edge. Now when you group this, you'll have a nice solid corner in there to print.